Hey guys, it's Saturday and uh, I found my marbles. I'm just joking, I never found them. These are not my marbles, I'm just holding them for a friend. Um, apologies for the lack of video past week, I had uh, some problems. Not actual problems, but I had some th other more important things to do. Um, but today, I promise I'll make up for the lack of video last time. And um, the first uh, thing that I actually went and saw at the flea market is going to be the last on today's video. Um, but, a uh, small teaser, this is at the end of it. And this is an old, I think it's an old West Germ uh, East German three-phase plug. Um, I don't think you're ever going to see uh, one of these again. And um, the thing that's tied to this very long, very thick, very gunky cable is probably one of the few ones that you'll be able to see in real life, like you'll, you'll be able to see on the internet. It's certainly the only one I'll be able to see in real life because I'm assuming they're very rare and having one in this condition under my um, desk right now it's, it's really interesting it's really fascinating but you'll have to wait for it so uh, sorry for pulling uh, this clickbaity thing but um, the first item is a bit more um, a bit more simple so I found one of these uh, boards at one of my local um, what do you call it suppliers one of the drug dealers basically um, and I recognized the Hamamatsu Blue and a what is evidently a photocell, photoelectric sensor. And um, so we have a vacuum tube with a cup shaped thing and another element inside. So I'm pretty sure that the cathode is the green lead, which goes to the cup. And the anode is going to the small slice, basically it's half a disc um, element inside. So these are photoelectric sensors from Hamamatsu. This is the R727 and they're pretty sensitive for UV and visible. I'm not entirely sure which one it is. It seems to be the uh, antimony cesium um, um, photocathode material um, and it's apparently going uh, it can work up to 100 volts uh, it's not very sensitive but its peak wavelength is uh, 350 nanometers or thereabouts so uh, in the configuration it's tied here this is an imp uh, JFET input op amp thanks to Yaromir for showing me the uh, actual data sheet. I was a bit conflicted about the numbers on these on this thing. So um, the um, I think I have it wired incorrectly here, but uh, it, it had a bit more, it had a longer leads and it actually had these two, the red and green leads. And I switched things around a bit. And um, so basically it's got a 500 meg uh, resistor and a 20 picofarad capacitor and the feedback of basically a, an inverting operational amplifier um, and what it's doing it's basically um, converting the photoelectric current into a voltage I'm going to uh, disconnect this and wire it back correctly and um, I am actually going to insert a photo of um, Basically, I stuck this onto the screen of my cell phone and uh, played some video and you can see the refresh rate of the screen um, being picked up by this thing. So my intuition due to the fact that there were two of these was that it came from something like a one of the video projectors, the film video projectors, uh, which had uh, audio tracks onto the film. So the film had a uh, slit of... Um, a very fine grade um, photosensitive material which was um, exposed in the shape shape of the audio signal so um, the 
audio was encoded into the film itself and to read it you'd need one photoelectric detector for each side. So basically two trans impedance amplifiers um, pretty actually that's quite a high resistor value it's 500 meg uh, actually 200 meg sorry um, and 20 picofarad so it's got to be I haven't got the faintest clue off the top of my head about the bandwidth of these things but I yet again I assume this is for audio for decoding the audio from the uh, film track I might be wrong but uh, yeah, anyway, it's a nice little board. The op amps are socketed and uh, you can see to preserve uh, a low leakage wiring uh, technique, they actually took the input of the op amp and tied it to this Teflon stake here. And the uh, feedback is actually staked onto the same Teflon thing. And there is a guard trace, this one here. I'm going to get a pointy thing. So there is a guard trace here running around and it's preventing the leakage in the sensitive nose basically. So this is similar techniques to what I would find in my 617 electrometer. Um, but in that thing it's just taken to the extreme. Okay, so I'm going to insert a photo of the thing I captured. I don't have any real way of getting complete darkness for this thing and just pulsing it with something very flat, fast and seeing the response time of this thing but um, as you might remember uh, this isn't the first high optical gain-ish thing I've seen like a sensitive optical detector I found I found this thing a while back and I talked about it in a previous video and these are basically kind of the same thing, only one of them is uh, silicon and one of them is a vacuum tube device. Um, funnily enough, they actually work kind of in the same way, only that uh, this relies on charge carriers in silicon and this one relies on electrons in a vacuum. So yeah, uh, that's the first item of the day. It's not very interesting, but these really, these photo detectors are really, really cute. I always loved Hamamatsu's uh, glass blowing, and yeah, it's just very pretty. And apparently, uh, so my friend uh, Giga Becquerel uh, said that uh, it might be some of the, the tubes in these series actually have gold. Um, gold uh, anodes or cathodes, I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, I'm going also to link the data sheet for this, this thing in the description if you're interested. Uh, yeah, so enough about this thing, let's go to the next item. Alright, so apologies, uh, some of you might already know that uh, this isn't the full thing. I have no idea what the full thing was and I didn't want to talk out of my own butt for too long. But this is the one thing that I know and I'm confident enough to share. Um, if I find another one of those things that I took this thing from, I'll probably uh, do a more attentive uh, investigation into the workings of that thing and I might come back with you and on the topic but this came from some soviet piece of aeronautics avionics or something like that and what is it well it's one of the prettiest clutches i've ever seen it's a gear reduction but it goes from one to one to something like ten to one and how does it do that well there's three gears uh concentrically on this piece here there's another two gears, these are tied together, so they're on the same shaft. Actually, if you hold this and spin the inside, you're overwhelming the clutch, and you can see that these two gears uh, run synchronously with one another. And there's a slight difference between the number of teeth on this gear, uh, the number of teeth on this gear, and the number of teeth on these two gears. So. If I take two of the leads from the power supply and bear with me a bit here because it's uh, kind of like herding cats, it's a bit more complex than uh, 
I'm not going to do any editing magic. You're just going to have to suffer through with me and look at me trying to figure things out. So I got my power supply turned on and I'm going to turn it up to 24 volts and I'm going to show you what happens when you actuate it. So you can see that if I spin this outer ring now, the inner uh, gear moves one to one basically. But if I turn on the power supply, you can hear a click. And now you can see that the inside one is spinning very slowly. Ain't that great? Like this is really cool. So what's happening here is that when I turn on the, oh look, you can even see it. When I turn on the power, there's an electromagnet which pulls the lower gear down, gets it stuck to the, the mechanism itself, and it frees it up from the main gear, the input, what I call the input. So what happens is that this gear now drives this gear here, which drives this gear, which drives this gear, and it drives it in reverse. So if these gears here and this one and the lower one were uh, paired, basically if these two had the same number of teeth and these two had the same number of teeth, then it w this shaft wouldn't move at all. But there's a slight difference in the number of gears uh, and the number of teeth between the sets, the matching sets. So this one is a bit uh, higher number than this one and this one is a bit lower number of teeth than this one or these two might be identical. Uh, the thing that matters is that because this has fewer teeth than this one or vice versa, uh, when I move this one, uh, the movement is transmitted from big to small, so it makes this one turn very fast, it makes this one turn very fast, and it would like to spin it that way. But because it has fewer teeth, it actually advances it. Ain't that great? Like, look, it's very satisfying. And she's gorgeous. And if you see, I can turn it off and it just moves one to one. It's beautiful. That's a very interesting way of getting very high reduction um, gearings in a very compact package and you can get selectable gear reduction. This is really cool. I love this piece of... Uh, uh, I love this mechanism here. It's really interesting. And um, I can show you a, bit, a few more bits and pieces from um, the thing that was uh, this was taken out of. So. Um, this, I assume, was a AC servo and with a drag cup rotor. I studied about these in university and these were called cup rotors because they look like a cup. And these were made for achieving very high RPM. And I remember one of the professors told us that these were kind of used in sewing machines. So. Uh, the thing is that we have, uh, we had, because I can't find the other one, there were two identical windings like this, potted in Bakelite or whatever kind of resin this is, and with their own wires. And um, this was basically a very high speed servo, and through a, a massive gear reduction, it was driving this thing. Um, and you could select the gear reduction yet again once more through this thing and the drive would end up in this thing which i think is a synchro solver or something like that so there's two brushes uh, two spaces for a brush to collect uh, a voltage from the winding there i can't take this out because there's a pin in here which i haven't got the tools to remove but if you apply a three-phase electrical signal to these wires and then you spin this around, you would get a phase-shifted sine wave with a phase shift proportional to the degrees you rotate it by. So I think that's a synchro solver or something like that. I'm not entirely sure uh, what it is, but you can see there's windings. This is very similar to... The winding I showed you earlier, they were all built in the same style with uh, being potted in that material. And you can sort of kind of see the 
uh, yeah, you can barely see it there, the core. So the uh, like uh, ferromagnetic core. So as I said, apologies, I took it apart. The curiosity got the best of me and I didn't feel like filming it. But if I find another one, and trust me, I'm going to do my best to find another one of these. Um, I'm going to try. Um, I'm going to try to drive the servo, drive this winding, and see what it was used for. Uh, my assumption, due to the construction of this thing and the amount of painstaking care that went to it, was that it was some sort of military something. Uh, you can see individually handwritten things. Um, yeah, just amazing effort. And these are extremely complex parts. I'm not sure if these were done on CNC machines or anything like that. They seem to be too old for that, but they're very, very nice. Oh, and this, um, this is a very particular kind of wire. wire. It's Teflon insulated wire and it's very flexible and it's extremely good for high temperature environments or corrosive environments or stuff like that. This is super nice cable. It's very good for um, any application where you need a very robust cable that will last a lifetime. So the, the dielectric on this, the insulator on this will not degrade over time at all. Right, so you can see why I keep telling you that I lose my marbles, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, give me a second and I'll try and get you the third fourth, third and fourth item. Oh, but yeah, so these were the two windings and the rotor was like this. And it's probably some sort of a dual winding servo, AC servo motor. I have no idea. I've never seen any sort of mach electric machine like this, electric motor. And it was yet again, individually serialized, numbered, stamped and matched and there were timing marks on the entire mechanism and yeah uh, enormous amounts of uh, work went into that okay let me go and get the next items item i think i'll just go and going to show you one because uh, it's uh, self-explanatory be right back all right so you know i like vfds everybody loves vfds right so what is this thing well it's just a calculator, but it's got a printer. And if you've seen the shorts, one of the shorts I published recently, you're gonna see that uh, I actually took some slow-mo video of this uh, printer thing. Th these were very common before the advent of um, thermal printers. And the mechanism is just, is just great. So it has uh, a DC motor that drives the whole carriage thingy. And it has a wheel with the characters here that just um, are, get pushed out and smacked into the paper. I don't have any, sorry, I don't have any paper to demonstrate it ag uh, again, but if we take the power supply and uh, turn it back down to something more reasonable, I assume this was going to be around six to nine volts and I'm putting it before the bridge rectifier because I can't, I don't care about polarity or anything. Uh, and you can see we have a digit. I have actually multiple digits um, on the display. So if I hit, you can see uh, I can do uh, operations and it will do math basically. And if I crank the current limit a bit higher, actually, so it won't go tripping the, um, basically it won't go tripping the power supply current protection. Uh, and if we hit print, Ain't that the cutest little mechanism? It's exactly like one of those IBM ball typewriters that had a ball that would smack in the correct position on the paper, on the actually on the indigo paper, on the transfer paper, and uh, imprint the letter. But instead of having a ball which can spin in two axes, it just has one uh, freedom of rotation, basically. And it's really, really cute. And it seems I, I love the look on the thing, and it's just in such of a hurry to get it printed. And yeah, and it hit error because it tripped the power supply. I'm not entirely sure exactly what the current limit should be on this thing, but it's 
it's really interesting. So let's take a bit of a closer look at the thing. So box standard mains transformer. Uh, somebody's been in here before and uh, yeah, there was probably a fuse around here or something like that. I don't know. Uh, bridge rectifier, a couple of fil filtering capacitors. And this is the uh, inverter stage for the high voltage ish for the VFD. It only runs at around 30 something volts. And then there's this chipset, which is the only piece of uh, com complex silicon in the entire thing, uh, which drives both the VFD and the printer. Um, now, because I have two of these, I don't feel that bad about unceremoniously destroying this entire mechanism for you on camera and showing it to you. Uh, so, um, if you wish, we can proceed that way. Leave your answer in the comments and I'll read it and see where... Of course I'm kidding, I'm gonna take this apart. I know you can't wait to see it. So, first of all, let's make sure that we're not missing anything uh, behind this. Oh, um, this PCB is just the membrane keypad and there's a few switches. There's nothing interesting underneath there, I promise. Um, and uh, we have another one here. And that's it just two screws holding this thing together and i was correct there's only one piece of silicon underneath the whole thing and the printer is a epson thing it's licensed by psycho epson corporation in hong kong etc etc so what i'm going to do is because you're here with me and uh, you can suffer along i'm going to try and uh, turn on my soldering iron by the way this is now almost six years old i've only changed one tip so this is my second ever tip for this wonderful soldering iron um if you want to know which one it is i'll uh, leave an answer uh, uh, a model number in the comments and maybe a few tips that i most uh, currently use but i found this this wedge shaped tip to be absolutely perfect for everything down to basically 0603 components and stuff like that. This is the Pace ADS200. It's the, I think it's one of the best soldering stations I've ever had. It's the, by far the best. Better than all the wellers and the arses and the JBCs. And I'm, I'm probably setting myself on fire because of you know, because I talked about JBC, but I have JBCs at work and I despise them. Okay. Holy words regarding um, soldering irons set aside. So let's take a closer look. So we can see that there's a lever here that pushes on a specific digit. You can see that these digits are just floating in this uh, shell. So you can actually push them up, right? And then there's a mechanism that indents them uh, positionally on this sort of a rack thing here. So this screw turns and then indents the carriage. I'm going to call this thing the carriage. One character left or right. And underneath here, I think we're going to find an encoder of sorts. I'm not entirely sure. I might even be able to put this thing back together uh, once I'm done with it, if I take it apart nicely enough. And if I don't, that's it. That's life. You know, uh, we make things more educationally friendly. So yeah, this was a interesting construction of an encoder. So we have a disc with some gold plating. I don't know how well you can see that. Uh, and when you spin this, it just shorts out some of these uh, fingers there and tells the confuser what the position of the thing is. Um, what I don't know is how it actuates the, um, you know, the thing that pushes the character out. I think it just, let's see. Okay, let's take it apart a bit further and see what's going on. So gear, sir clip, and we have a planetary arrangement with just a single planet there, 
so yeah you can see the small gear inside um, so this gear is connected here and it meshes with this gear and it rests against the gear carved inside here okay and uh, that's a speed reduction basically just that and now here we have something which might oh right okay so this is a I'm assuming this is some sort of a clutch or an actuator I have no idea it's pretty complex actually if you think about it so this is a coil which I think just what happens is I think that's a magnet and this coil just stops the um, the shaft from spinning so whatever is happening inside I think it just stops the shaft from spinning and when it does that it triggers the um, next uh, it triggers the writing of the character so let's see if I can convince it to uh, mesh because there's two coaxial gears riding on the same shaft right here and uh, there's some missing teeth in this gear here so I'm trying to get it to mesh and you can see that it only meshes in a few certain positions so anyway the thing is that um, whatever triggers the thing which I assume to be this coil here resisting the movement of this gear against the shaft uh, triggers the clunk and it knows when to do the clunk based on the number of turns it's uh, done from the start okay so that was a complete waste of time uh, we've left with more questions than answers but that's usually what happens when you come into these kind of things um, I don't want to, in want to invest too much time into this thing because uh, the next item on the list which is the final one for today is really going to knock your socks off I am pretty sure okay let me just um, rearrange things a bit because uh, it's it's kind of large sweet lord it's so big that my wide angle looks like crap um, <laughs> Can you tell what it is? I'm giving you a couple of hints. Um, this is a three-phase motor. And this is a camera. Why would you ever need a three-phase motor on a camera, you ask? Well, this is not any sort of camera. The lens would have gone in here. The lens is completely screwed. I uh, just threw it away. It was completely smashed. The rest of the camera is in mint condition why would you need a three-phase motor rated for 600 watts running on 380 400 volts basically 3000 rpm uh, why would you need such a massive motor on a camera well you'd need it if you wanted to make it go very fast this is a pentacet Pentacet, Pentacel, Pentacet, it's a size icon, actually a Pentacon, um, East German high-speed camera running on 16 millimeter film. It was actually used uh, in cinematography as well, and I'm going to try and link where it was used. Uh, it was used in a decapitation scene uh, in an Italian film or something like that. Uh, but yeah, this is a Pentacet 16, 2000 frame a second, 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter camera. And um, I'm going to take this off so I can move this around and show you the inner workings because it's also very interesting. And I'm pretty sure nobody's ever going to uh, find one of these again at a flea market in Romania. And I might have just uh, scratched the hell out of my mouse bed. Anyway it's giant um, this is where power comes in this is tight mark I think means time marker so time code and there's a few gears underneath here look at this machine gears very nice relatively low backlash gears and th these are for setting I think the frame rate so you'd have sets of gears to set the frame rate of the camera
because these are both marked 1000 so and assuming that there are uh, gear sets for the higher speeds this camera was capable of actually shooting up to 4000 frames a second so uh, it would make one of those 16 millimeter film rolls go back go by in quite a hurry and you can see on the motor plate let me just zoom in a bit okay okay 220-380, so this is Y Delta wire windings, wiring, um, three-phase motor, it's made by Junker and Co. in Berlin, um, 0.6, I'm not sure how clear you're going to see, yeah, 600 uh, watts, and 28.50 or 29.50 RPM. Um, this is an asynchronous motor, and I know that because it says 29.50 RPM. Uh, asynchronous motors always have a parameter called slip. Slip is basically the difference between the RPM of the rotor and the frequency of the mains that you put into it. It's more complicated than that because it depends on the number of poles a motor has, but for a single pole pair motor, uh, slip is basically the difference between the RPM and the frequency. So, um, this is a single pole pair motor uh, due to the fact that at 50 hertz you can only get to up to this number about 3000 revolutions a minute if you go higher pole pairs uh, it will half for two pole pairs then quarter for uh, sorry uh, it would have for two pair uh, two pole pairs then quarter for uh, four pole pairs etc etc so this number would go down, 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 increasingly uh, getting smaller by two every time you add another pair of poles. Um, what do you need to get higher uh, RPM than this? You need more frequency. I'm going to insert the formula in here. And um, yeah, holy crap. And uh, it says that it can run for one minute maximum. Um, uh, every 10 minutes that was the standard before so uh, you can tell this motor is pretty worked up if it has to drive a very high speed camera okay so I'm going to zoom out just a tad I'm going to pause while I take this monstrous thing off oh let's have a look at the let's try and have a look at the connections in here Give me just a second until I figure out how to take this box off. All right, so I did that almost for nothing because you can see the, you can barely see the windings here, but this, this is a uh, Y connection. So you can see uh, one end of all the windings is tied together and the other ends are connected here. If these were going uh, parallel, so one winding, sorry, like this, so one winding going into the next one, it would have been a delta or triangle configuration of wiring. So depending on the uh, electricity service you have, either 220 three phase or 380 three phase, you'd need to run this in either a Y or a delta configuration to match the voltage. Um, the speed stays the same because it's just a function of the frequency of the mains, but uh, the current doesn't because it's basically um, in a Y uh, configuration, you have two windings in series over one leg, basically of the, um, between two legs of the three phase system and each winding is seeing less voltage. The power of the motor also goes down by the, it's, uh, so it goes down by nine times if you run it at lower voltage if i am correct i might be wrong so the voltage on each um each leg would be i'm babbling sorry i'll insert the page on the asynchronous motor from wikipedia and we can uh, address that there i don't really remember that much about uh, asynchronous machines from university but uh, suffice it to say, if you power a um, motor that's rated for 380 volts off of 220, you're going to... Uh, actually, if you power a motor that's configured to run in a Y uh, from a wrong voltage or in a delta from the wrong voltage, you either get 
almost no power or you get a smoking motor. Okay, that's enough of me forgetting miserably, failing miserably to remember how electric motors worked uh, in university. Uh, let me take this off and um, I'm going to show you a bit of the insights. It's going to be much lighter. Right, so I took the liberty of taking the screws out. You can see they're here and pan heads because of course and uh, we don't need no capitalist Philips in East Germany oh Jesus so you can see just a big gear and some really nice bearings actually for such a big motor I'm gonna sit this down carefully Jesus Christ and we can take a look at this lovely package in here just let me move some things around okay so input power comes in here and you can see some lovely lovely gear meshes so we have a 90 degree bevel gear meshing here and it's going to this gear set we talked earlier about so this basically sets the frame rate of the entire camera everything is just so thick look at the thickness of this cast block here like they weren't messing about and Jesus Christ, it's Germans, right? And um, another, so it comes in here, it goes out here where it meets another 90 degree bevel, and then it goes to these two gears and um, to this thing here, and then it goes up. And what's behind here? Oh, uh, that's no surprise, it's the film transport. So you can see the beautiful logo, Pentazit 16, and this is the viewfinder. Um, it has a shutter, so in order to open it up, you have to press on this thing. I think that's to not get any light into the camera while um, you have film inside. So nice, chunky, very lovely feeling. and. The hammerite paint is on this thing is just gorgeous. The thing is completely mint condition. Apart from a few nicks, there's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. Um, I think this is a range finder or a focus finder. Uh, it's more like a composition aid. I have no idea what it's used for. Uh, it's like a gun sight. And you can change up to, depending on where you focus, I think it's something to do with the parallax error i think it's for in case you don't have this speaking of this uh this comes off and is just a 90 degree angle viewfinder angle finder whatever you want to call it right beautiful you can have a diopter adjustment but it's a bit stiff i think you need some grease on it or something like that and um you can see there's another lens in here and if we open this up there's some ball detents that uh, I hope not to lose because this thing was yeah there's three ball detents in here so I'm going to make sure that these ball bearings don't uh, fly away just a second I need my hemostats Oh, thank you for the thank you to the kind person who reminded me that these are actually called hemostats. I forgot about their actual term. Yet again, if you're doing anything and you don't have a pair of these, what are you doing? Okay, so yet again, extremely thick cast. Uh, I think this might be. It's not cast iron because that would be too heavy, but it's something like cast aluminum or something like that. So this is the lens mount here. It's some sort of a small lens system. I am not entirely sure. This is uh, one of these is the take up, take up spool and one of them is the uh, feeder spool. I'm not entirely sure which is which. But the idea is that um, the film would get wound through here over this capstan or drive wheel or whatever you call it in here and there's a mechanism that latches this thing open so you can wind the film but it's not really working as it should and it's a bit less clickety clackety it should stay latched in a position like this so you can feed the film easily through here this is the shutter block 
and then we would get one through here and put on the uh, take up spool. Uh, so, um, when the thing is running, these things are whizzing by at thousands of frames a second, as I said, 2000 frames a second. And you can see that the viewfinder actually looks through here. So if you have a piece of film inside, you cannot see uh, through the camera. Uh, it's not one of those things that were like the eye reflexes that had the mirror and it shot off the um, image to... So as long as the film wasn't exposing, you could see the image. So this isn't the case here. Uh, this is fully all the time uh, as long as there's film inside you can't shoot through it so that's why there's probably this um, it's more like a composition aid focus finder I have no idea anyway um, yeah and if we turn it to the side this way Jesus Christ this is heavy uh, we can see the shutter and the shutter works very interestingly there's a I think a multifaceted prism, which just, um, I'm not going to take this apart, it's too gorgeous, but I, I assume that there's just a prism which, uh, in, case that, uh, in the case that the image isn't perfectly, like the optical path isn't perfectly straight through, um, there's going to be no uh, image through it. Oh, by the way, I tried hooking up my power drill to the end of the electric motor because it has one of the cranks you can crank it hand crank it for very slow um, footage um, yeah that was scary so my drill tops out at around 20 something 100 rpm yeah no I'm not gonna do that it's just holy crap I, I imagine this whizzing around at nigh on 3000 rpm these things are actually going even faster than that because it's a it's a speed written increase from here to here so holy crap imagine that and the last thing I want to try and figure is this time code generator Zeit mark Zeit means time in German and mark should mean mark uh, I want to see how exactly this thing works because it's related to this tubular thing here it's totally tubular man um, oh, and this is a clutch, I think. Yeah, uh, this is a clutch that can slip, so uh, it's not always engaged. See, uh, there's a pressure plate, and if you pull on it, it tries moving. Anyway, um, lots of... Uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, despite the fact that this is an extremely complex piece of equipment, it's not that mechanically complex as you think because when running at such incredible speeds you can't really have any mechanical complexity so you can't have um, mechanisms that shuttle back and forth because they would just destroy themselves um, another way that people would use to make uh, high-speed cameras was to have a mirror a set of film wound on a basically a circular uh, surface and then you'd have a mirror projecting an image scanned over across that uh, film and that's how you got very high-speed cameras in the past before the phantoms basically okay give me a few seconds and I'll try and see if I can take this out I think somebody's been in here tried to take this out before me the screws are pretty loose and um, yeah I'm not sure is this cast iron no it's got to be something like aluminium or magnesium or something be right back. Jesus Christ, that was the most stressful screw to take out ever in my entire life. These aren't long for this world. Okay. Let's see what's inside here, shall we? Right, so... Um, there's a prism there. I don't know if you can see it, yeah. 
and it's heading into here. This might be some sort of an optical detector. Let's try and destroy it beyond repair. Like, who's going to make a time code thing for this? Oh yeah, you can see... You can see there's a small optical window there, which matches perfectly to this thing here. And it's probably something optical detector, some sort of optical detector. I'm going to desolder these wires and uh, try and work at it a bit more carefully so as to not destroy it. Uh, and then I'm going to solder them back when I put it back together. Be right back. Right, so we're left with this. And I'm not entirely sure if you can see in those holes, but those are some set screws. And this one's too big, but this one might be just what the doctor ordered to take out these screws here and try and remove that cap. And I think it's working. Jesus. Okay, I can't focus enough to do this and talk to you guys, so you're just gonna have to give me one second. Jesus Christ, I hope they don't see the chips. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I didn't um, <clears throat> drill out any set screws. That was just a um, minor illusion. So Jesus, what do we have? What do we have here? Well, let's see. Um, that's some sort of tube, I think. Um, looks like there might be mercury inside of it. A uh, shiny bit there. Um, do you remember when I just told you that sometimes uh, things just give you more questions than answers? Well, this one gave me a broken screwdriver, for Christ's sake. Look at this. Can you see it? It's wallered out nice and proper. Okay, there is apparently one more set screw around here. I hope this one will just willingly submit. And it did. If I can just keep it intact while I'm unscrewing it. So how's your guys been? How's your guys day been? It's kind of been rainy here for the past few weeks. Oh, it moved. It did. It moved. And slowly. What in God's name is this thing? It's a Fressler. PL32-17. I have no idea what this thing is. It can be unscrewed and disconnected like this. And um, it's socketed, wherever it might be. Jesus Christ, I'm going to... You're going to see the first Pressler vacuum tube blow up on YouTube live. I don't know what this thing is. This thing is. It's some sort of optical de uh, detector, so sort of like the Hamamatsu thing we saw previously. There's another set screw here. Jesus Christ, they love their set screws, didn't they? Remember when Monarch put set screws underneath set screws and lathes? Yeah, this reminds me of that. Okay, so I'm not sure if this thing is going to pop out. Oh. Stupid me. There's a circlip back here. And it might not pop out because of the solder, but sure I'm going to try. Oh, finally. Jesus, what the hell is this thing? I'm just um, literally gobsmacked at how I've never seen anything like this. It's got to be... So let's figure this out together. It's only got two terminals, which means that it doesn't have a heater, which means it's a cold cathode lamp or whatever. Um, it's got a Bakelite and brass socket, which means it's very early something 30s 40s something like that i'm pretty sure that that's not mercury i'm pretty sure that it's some sort of like oh 
it might be seems to kind of be drippy um one second i'll be right back all right so i've actually found um a page about these things on a lamp tube dot info um it says it's a modulable glow discharge tube for intensity control of the cathode glow light. I have no idea what it is. It's a spot lighting lamp. It's a plug type cinema cap. So this is a plug type cinema cap. Its starting voltage is 180 volts and a mean load of 50 milliamps. Um, I don't have anything that goes to 50 milliamps at 180 volts but I do have something that goes up much higher in voltage and can be current limited. Did you hear that? That's the 237 firing up. Let's see. Uh, just out of curiosity. Jesus. Sorry for the impromptu style of these videos. I, I think some of you actually like them like this. Uh, I've never gotten any complaints about the production values um, and honestly, I don't feel like investing a lot more money into this hobby. Uh, I'd rather just have cool things to show you every day rather than just have something uh, very expensive to show from time to time. Well, you, you understand, not every day, but from time to time, weekly. So I'm going to actually do something very stupid because a source meter unit isn't designed for anything like this. Now I'm going to hit operate. I'm going to set a compliance to 10 milliamps, which is the maximum. Operate, and I'm going to slowly inc increase the voltage from 10 to from 10 by 10 volts uh, until we see what happens. So 20 volts, 30 volts, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Uh, don't do this at home, kids. Oh, and I'm also going to turn off the um, uh, light so you can see what's going on. 110, we need to go up another range, 120, 30, 40, 50, 60, oh and it glows, look at that, Jesus Christ, how cool is this, focus, look at that, that's so pretty, what is this thing, I have never seen anything like this, I mean, just look at this. It's so gorgeous. Wow. And it's limiting at 10 milliamps, so I'm not probably I'm probably not destroying anything. Um, weird. Cool, right? I've locked the exposure so we can look at some of the features of this thing so there's a definite glow discharge in there and um, yeah I don't know what this thing is but it's beautiful I have no idea how it could uh, create any time code or anything like that I'm just gonna turn it down a bit oh yeah now that see 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 that's that's more reasonable so I've, uh, once you start it, it's, I think it needs to be ballasted. So once you've started it, now it seems to be doing something. And, um, yeah, it's got a very pretty discharge. And, um, I'm looking at the current that the source meter is, uh, um, sinking sourcing into this thing and i can see the current is actually fluctuating when i uh, put my hand over it when i darken it so if i increase the emission current a bit actually the voltage is too high now and then just go volt by volt oh it went out sorry it might be the wrong polarity let's try it uh, the other way around uh, Here's the non-scripted part of the interview. Oh, and you can see, I think you can see that it's getting foggy. I think those are indeed mercury things on the tube itself. So, 140, 50, 80. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now it's making a bit more sense. 
Uh, so we're... I am completely lost for anything. I have no idea what this thing does. I've never been so completely godsmacked about anything in my entire life. And I'm... Can you see how stupid I am? Uh, luckily, this thing is ground. So I'm very far away from... Um... Jesus Christ, I should do an entire video about this thing. Characterizing it and seeing its uh, specific emission something. I would love to have a spectrometer and see exactly what the... Um, uh, what do you call it? What the spectral response of this thing is. Um, I'm looking and trying to figure out if I actually got it at the correct polarity. Um, I have no idea. Any ideas, guys? Have you ever seen something like that before? I think I don't have enough power to give it because it's maxing out at the, as I said, 10 milliamps. And uh, so this is 2 milliamps already and it's glowing really brightly. And uh, yeah, you can see that it's, I think this is the characteristic emission of mercury. It looks like a mercury vapor lamp. It looks much more orange than it does in uh, real life. In real life, it's much more purpley. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. Anyway, I've rambled long enough. Look at this thing. It's so pretty. Jesus, I could just watch it all day. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to uh, focus it in a bit more. Get it a bit darker. And... Uh, give you like five minutes of basking in this thing's glory at the end of the video so um thank you for watching and um i'll see you again whenever i find something not as cool as this because this is pretty high up there but something is almost as cool as this Um, if you're still here, 
I realized that I have a Nixie power supply that spits out about 170 volts. Um, I'm gonna try and hook it up to that thing because it's capable of way more than uh, 10, milliamp 10 milliamps and uh, see what happens. Just a second. This is so far beyond into not even worth trying to edit now because I'm just gonna leave it as is. So here's the power supply, the Nixie thing I made a while back. And um, I'm just gonna find some alligator clips, stuff like that. for the uh, basically for the high voltage side because the low voltage side I already have some uh, banana jacks inside in the power supply so I'm gonna stick one of these things here it will go away no 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 and I'm gonna stick the other one here and um, actually I can't really remember I think it wanted like five volts and it's turned on. Let's turn it up first. And let's see what happens with this. Wish me luck. Wait, wait, wait. I can see it. It's getting there. Oh yeah, that's much brighter. I think it just ignited com correctly, I'm pretty sure. Oh no. Holy crap, it's pulling almost 4 watts. I think it's too much. Yeah. So... This was the scripted event uh, it's almost one watt as it is right now and if I switch the polarity, polarity around it's more than five so it's almost one amp at five volts it's going down a bit right now and it looks brilliantly uh, yellow, like a golden color on the camera, but it's actually very purpley. Uh, it's exactly the color you have for like those uh, um, street lamps, the mercury vapor ones. Gorgeous, isn't it? Okay, this video is going to be over an hour. I should stop by now, you know? Look at that for a few minutes, for a few seconds actually.